Hi there, welcome to The Journey Church, and my name's David Morehouse. In these past number of months, we've been looking at this big idea called faith in real life, or at faith IRL. Um, I don't know about you, but in these days and in other days, I have always found that what real life does to my faith is that it pushes and pulls me away from wanting to believe or trust in God. You know, for example, right now we are in a, a situation that is called COVID-19. And with this global pandemic, it is tempting to start thinking in this way, where we say, um, God is gone. And the moment I believe God is gone, I start to move to a place of panic and self-preservation rather than living out a life of love, compassion, and selflessness. The Bible tells us in Romans 12 too, it says, let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. See, we have to think differently. Our faith has to shape us in a way. God wants us to look at life with a whole different perspective. And so our goal is, is that we want to wrestle out what all that means and how we change our thinking. We want to encourage you to continue to join us in this journey as we look really at who Jesus is and what he said and what he did. And by doing that, um, we can discover what it means to live um, a life where we share in God's life through faith in Christ. We welcome you on this exciting journey of faith. Well, welcome to everybody who's in our live stream. If you're a visitor, if you're a Journey Church member, we're just so glad you're here. This is new to us. We've never done a live stream before, uh, but we are thankful that we have the opportunity to have community. If you're like me, you've been home some this week, more than usual, and you're beginning to think, wow, I actually really liked my friends more than I thought, and uh, you want to have community. For us, we want to give you that opportunity to have community together. We recognize that all through the week you're doing different stuff, but we want to separate this time as God time, community time, have some time together to share, uh, to comment, to pray together, and to hear a message and to read the scriptures. I'd like to open uh, today with the words from Matthew, from the teacher Jesus, Matthew 11:28, 30. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. We appreciate the words of the Christ today. We look forward to being together with you. And uh, right now we've got uh, something for the kids from our teaching or our pastor of families and uh, kids, Sarah. And we hope you enjoy the video, kids. Good to see you. I'm glad we could meet together today and, and have a little chat. And actually, Barry sent me a message, and I thought maybe we could look at it together. And then uh, he asked a question, and we can talk about it after. So let's hear what Barry had to say. Hi, Sarah. I got your note. I was so glad to see your face. I don't see many faces these days outside of my family. I just wanted to tell you that I am super bored. I've done all my coloring. I've done most of my Lego. I'm running out of ideas, Sarah. I would love it if you could get back to me one more time and maybe give me some ideas of stuff that would keep me from being so bored. Anyway, great to see your face and I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Well, I think we can all identify with what Barry's going through. We may be feeling a little stir crazy or not sure how to spend our time and can be feeling bored or unsettled about it. I was thinking about this and that God created us with imaginations. So he gave us the ability to imagine things, to be creative. It might look different from person to person how they're being creative or how they imagine things. But I think there's some special to do with our imagination that might help. I was thinking of a Bible verse that we've used 
uh, in our journey kids and it talks about Jesus as the Good Shepherd so I'm gonna read you some of those verses they're from the Gospel of John which is in the New Testament and we're gonna to go to chapter 10 and verse 14 so we're in John chapter 10 and we're gonna start in verse 11 Jesus says I am the Good Shepherd the Good Shepherd sacrifices his life for the sheep a hired hand will run when he sees a wolf coming he will abandon the sheep because they don't belong to him and he isn't their shepherd and so the wolf attacks them and scatters the flock. The hired hand runs away because he's working only for the money and doesn't really care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own sheep and they know me. So as I was thinking about that, I was thinking that with my imagination, I can picture Jesus as the good shepherd. I can picture myself as one of his sheep. Now, I know I'm not really a sheep, but I can kind of picture myself, because what are some things a shepherd does? A shepherd um, helps the sheep to find good food. A shepherd takes them to places where they can drink water and it's safe to drink, because he wouldn't want to take them to muddy, dirty water, or he wouldn't want to take them to a river that was moving really fast that they might fall in and get swept away. No, the shepherd finds some really good, safe places for them to be. And we can use our imagination to picture that in our mind. We can also use our imagination and creativity to make something. Maybe uh, you would like to have that picture in your mind and draw a picture about it. You could picture Jesus as the shepherd, yourself as a sheep, or maybe you'd like to write something like a poem or write out the words Jesus is the Good Shepherd and decorate it. Or maybe you prefer Lego or building blocks and to build something about that. Or maybe even you like to do drama and you like to act out something with your family and videotape it. I want to challenge you and Barry to come up with something creative with that image of Jesus as the Good Shepherd. So why don't we do that this week and next week we'll talk, see what Barry's up to and see if he's got come up with some other ideas. So I hope that helps you. I hope that helps Barry. And I look forward to seeing you guys again. I hope you have a great week. Bye. Well, thank you, Sarah, and thank you, Barry. Sarah, your voice is calming for me for sure and for all the families that are out there uh, we're sure that you appreciate uh, being together during this time and you've had maybe more time together than you've ever had. But as a family, I just uh, I hope that you take this time for you, take this time to grow together, read the Bible together, uh, play board games, whatever you need to do, and uh, really grow in your relationships. Well, we're going to be moving now to a time of pastoral prayer. And the Bible says where two or three are gathered, there I am also. And uh, even though uh, you might be sitting on your computer alone. We hope that you feel that there is community right now, even on this live stream, that there's people out there that are all going to be praying together right now, that are going to be coming to God together. And um, with that in mind, I just, I'll invite you to close your eyes, bow your heads together uh, at home, and pray with me. Let's pray. Dear God, uh, we come to you today in this time, uh, a new time for many of us. This is unprecedented. This is new ground, and um, we, we're looking for answers, and we have many questions. Yet, Lord, we trust you, and we love you, and we thank you that you bring uh, a sense of hope and calm and peace in the midst of these challenging times. Lord, for the people who don't know you, I pray that they would seek answers through you and understand that you have some. And yet, Lord, as we consider how we must act and, and be in these times. We, um, we just want to be wise and um, take this time to take a deep breath for their families and loved ones. God, uh, for the people at home, I pray that they see opportunity in this. For the people that are looking for opportunities to be a good neighbor, Lord, I just pray that they would find opportunity in this. 
God, for the people that are looking to invite someone to church, that they would see opportunity in this, that we can be um, church members who have never really had an easier time to invite someone to church. God, uh, we recognize that you're on the throne. You're out there, you love us, and you're with us. God, help us to be wise. Help us to find love in these situations and to be good neighbors. Um, as Christians, there's nothing we can do better than to be good neighbors and be trusting of you. So, in Jesus' name we pray. In this segment, we are taking a moment to have an interview with Dr. Heather Kelly. Heather has been part of our church family recently, and we just want to ask her some questions um, to help us navigate um, the COVID-19 reality. Hi, I'm Heather Kelly. Uh, I'm a family physician here in Moncton. I grew up in Moncton, and uh, my husband Pablo and myself and our two children, uh, Tomas and Mika, started coming here um, within the last couple years, and I'm happy to talk to you guys today. What we know about COVID-19 is that it is transmitted through something that we call uh, droplets, which means that if you sneeze or if you cough or you come in contact with, with, with fluids, then you could potentially um, get this virus. What it doesn't mean is that at this point in time, we do not think that it is airborne transmission like something uh, such as measles. So I'm sure that everyone's heard a lot about kind of the best ways for us to avoid transmitting uh, COVID-19. And so one of the main things is this concept of social distancing, which is, means essentially not going out where there's going to be a lot of people, keeping a safe distance, which they're saying is about six feet from someone if you do need to go out, for example, to the store, to an appointment, um, and just really trying to kind of keep um, within kind of what they call like your family unit for the most part uh, to avoid contact with a lot of people. Uh, the good news about this virus is that we do know that infection control measures work and so that would be something like washing your hands after you've been out, um, using hand sanitizer, also wiping down surfaces. For example, if the virus was on here, which we do, it, we do know that it can live on surfaces, using a Lysol wipe um, can be helpful. So wiping down highly trafficked things like uh, doorknobs, um, tables, flat surfaces, like at doctor's appointments is what we've been doing. If you want to get tested, um, first you will have to go through someone to see if you meet the criteria for testing. And so that would be either through 811, they can uh, refer you to our special uh, COVID assessment clinic that has been up and running since uh, Saturday at the Moncton Hospital. That is not a clinic that you can just show up to. Um, you have to be referred either through public health 811 or through uh, your family physician. Um, the new thing this week is that family physicians can refer people directly to that clinic um, after speaking to you on the phone. So if your family physician speaks to you on your phone, agrees that you need testing, they fax over a referral and you will be contacted usually within an hour or two about an appointment and told the directions from there. So young, healthy people actually have a huge role to play in preventing this becoming um, a generalized pandemic. And the reason is that we know that young, healthy people, children, although they may not get very sick at all and might have only very mild symptoms, they do act as vectors for the disease. And so you'll have to be selfless in terms of, you know, not going out to see friends, not going to that restaurant or that movie right now. Um, essentially what you're doing is you're protecting older people or people who are immunocompromised. So, you know, think about your parents, your grandparents, um, our older congregants at the church here, people who are going through treatment. So what you are doing essentially is trying to pr protect those vulnerable members of society. So there are a lot of questions of, in terms of how far we need to take this kind of social isolation, social distancing. For example, family get-togethers, extended family get-togethers, are those still okay? And honestly, at this point in time, the best thing would be to try to avoid kind of any kind of large groups, extended family gatherings. This doesn't mean that you can't call someone or FaceTime someone or, you know, 
talk to them otherwise, but having, you know, your grandparents or cousins over for supper or for a play date, at this point in time, we would not recommend that. Now, I know there are sometimes certain um, limitations that people have and they need people to help take care of the kids and that sort of thing. And that will uh, be necessary. But if you can try to pick kind of, you know, one or two people that you might have more contact with during this time, that would be best. So obviously my faith as a Christian is a big part of my life as well as uh, being a physician and I do think in this time of anxiety and uncertainty um, that my faith does give me comfort and to know that, that God is always with me no matter what is happening. Um, I do think of the the verse of love your neighbor as yourself and I think especially during this time um, my work as a physician uh, I feel that this is my way to serve my neighbor um, while I, you know, practice my profession, but also as a way to serve God. Well, thank you, Dr. Kelly, and we appreciate uh, that update from you. Um, over the last week, I've seen a lot of posts from a lot of people and a lot of Christians, and so many people would just say, oh, we just need to have faith, we just need to have faith. And Dr. Kelly points that out too. She says she has faith, but at the same time, She's talking about wisdom, and faith won't do in the kind of situations where wisdom is necessary. And it's good for us to be wise, it's good for us to be diligent, and it's good for us to do everything we can to counteract the spread of this, and to be wise as people, and keep faith all the same. Well, uh, we're now going to move into the message portion of today, and for many of you, you've toyed with the idea of who is God for a long time, and for some of you, if you're just tuning into our live stream, and this isn't a question that you uh, look to on a regular basis or a weekly basis, but something you've often considered. We hope that this will be a time where you can really consider who is God. And today we're going to be looking at uh, God Shows Up, and this is from our lead pastor, Dave Morehouse. Uh, we appreciate uh, his words, and uh, we hope that at home with your family, you will find comfort in these words as well. Who is God? How do you answer that question? I really believe that um, it reveals a lot about all of ourselves, about how we approach that question, think about that question. Maybe some of you dismiss it. Maybe some of you really ponder it. Maybe for some of you, it just overwhelms you. But again, let me ask you, who is God? In these weeks leading up to Easter, we want to try to answer that profound question in a very specific way. We want to look at the stories of Jesus. Why? Well, in the Gospels, we read Jesus making this incredible claim. At one point, he says, if you have seen me, you've seen the Father. Jesus makes this extraordinary claim that he and the Father are one. And so for all of us, if we want to understand who God is, we have to look at Jesus. The Bible tells us that Jesus is Emmanuel. It's the old Hebrew word which means God with us. So we're convinced that when we look at the stories of Jesus, we'll start to understand actually more about who God is and how he's revealing himself to you and to me. So today, we want to look at a story about Jesus in which we simply entitle it, God Showing Up. It's found in Mark chapter 6, verses 1 to 6. And I want to read that for you now, so follow along. Jesus left that part of the country and returned with his disciples to Nazareth, his hometown. The next Sabbath, he began teaching in the synagogue, and many who heard him were amazed. They asked, where did he get all this wisdom and the power to perform such miracles? Then they scoffed. He's just a carpenter, the son of Mary and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon. And his sisters live right here among us. They were deeply offended and refused to believe in him. Then Jesus told them, A prophet is honored everywhere except in his own hometown and among his relatives and his own family. And because of their unbelief, he couldn't do any miracles among them except to place his hands on a few sick people and heal them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. Then Jesus went from village to village teaching the people. Today I want to 
talk about this story and as we under and as we try to again wrestle with this question of who is God. You know, the, the first point I want us to think about is how familiarity breeds contempt. I, I, I get a sense that Jesus understood about him going back to his hometown in Nazareth that he wasn't going to get a big grand reception. Jesus' ministry had already begun to make a footprint and enlarge among the region. He was known for his miracles and for his teaching. And even here, we know that the people who came and listened to him said, wow, Jesus is a great teacher and, and he really is doing miracles. And yet, in that moment, they then start to um, um, reduce him down. They, they start to say he's just one of us. They say, look, he, he, he grew up with his family. We know his family. He's just the son of a carpenter. And not only that, then, then regardless of what the claims he was making in his teaching, that in him you could find life. In him he was bringing forth the kingdom of God. In him that, that there was another way to, for us to share in God's life. People couldn't understand it. People couldn't believe it. So they, they, they dismissed it. They, they simply did not want to believe. You know, when I think about, about all this, Jesus makes the remark. He says, um, you know, a prophet is honored everywhere except in his hometown and among his relatives and his own family. I, I don't know about you, but, but, but I, I sort of resonate with that in the sense of I think all of us have had that experience where, you know, we grew up in our hometown, we grew up among our family and our friends, and then we go off and, and, and we, we study and we become something or we um, are able to uh, accomplish something, and we come back and yet we're still just that little 12-year-old boy or that little 10-year-old girl. I, I, I have to admit, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm terribly guilty of this when I, I meet my sister, I mean, here she is now. I, I won't tell her age, except she's certainly getting older. And, and here she is. She's a, a senior manager at a major corporation in um, Atlantic Canada. She has major responsibilities. She has teams and everyone reporting to her. And yet when I see her, I still see her as my little 10-year-old uh, sister who we used to go sliding down hills with during the wintertime. I mean, we're, we all can dismiss people. But, but here, Jesus is being dismissed in a really radical way. And I guess that what we need to pause just for a moment and ask is, why were the people unable to believe? Why were the people wanting to dismiss Jesus and scoff at him and, and minimize who he was? Because I think they understood this, that if they really began to believe what he was teaching and what he was doing and what he was claiming to be, that their lives would be upended that their lives would go face a major transformation. And, and I don't know about you, but I think our default as people is instead of to believe, it's not to believe, it's, it's to doubt. That's part of our brokenness. And so we put up these walls and these barriers and we say, no, I, I can't believe. I, 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 if I did, it would change everything. Well, that, that brings us to, to the, the next point of, of this encounter with God. We're just saying, regardless of people's reactions, that God still showed up. Jesus showed up. That even though he knew there would be a level of resistance, even though he knew that there would be scoffing and indifference, he came. He he came to minister. He came to heal. He came to teach. He came to love. I, I can't help but think of John 1 where, where this author reflects on the coming of Jesus where he writes, he, that's Jesus, came into the very world he created, but the world didn't recognize him. He came onto his own people even though they rejected him. It's amazing how, how, how God comes even when we push him away. How God shows up in our lives even when we don't want to pay attention to him. And what we see here is that Jesus is revealing to us the very heart of God, that no one is beyond his reach. He doesn't want anyone to be lost. He wants everyone to be saved. 
You know what gives me hope here is that God shows up despite people's reactions. It doesn't determine God's response. I can't help but think that, that as we think about God showing up here, he shows up not for the righteous, but for the sinners. He shows up not for those who are whole, but for those who are broken. God shows up for all of us who are understanding that we're in need. You know, as we finish up this story, not only do we see that, uh, uh, you know, the familiarity that breeds contempt and how people react, you know, in a dismissive way with Jesus. And not only do we see that, that Jesus shows up despite this resistance, but finally we see how God doesn't force himself on us. I, I, I think about the wider stories of Jesus in the Gospels, of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, and where there were times that Jesus did reveal, sort of, so to speak, pull the curtain back and show his power. I mean, he was in the boat with the disciples we heard just a few weeks ago preached by Micah, and, and I mean, he did calm the storm. There's other times in which we see him feeding, you know, thousands with just a few fish and loaves. I, I can't help but think as we come towards Easter, and I think about um, at the trial of Jesus where we're told that Jesus could call a legion of angels if he wanted to. But Jesus didn't do any of this. He simply came quietly, and he didn't force himself. He simply just extended his hand, and he offered it to anyone who wanted to come and experience his love and his presence. I mean, this is what, what Jesus is once again revealing us about God, that God doesn't force himself upon us. He, he in this mystery of faith and, 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 and relationship with him, it's a mystery of where God does not force himself upon us. Well, why is that? I, I, I think it simply comes to a, a quote uh, I came across where it says, even God cannot make us love him, and love cannot be forced. Otherwise, it's not, it's not love. See, God wants us to love him with all of our heart, our soul, and our mind. Love cannot be forced. Now, now again, in this story, what I think is amazing is this, is that for the few people who did show up, It simply says here that Jesus placed his hands on a few sick people and healed them. As though, oh, well, look what happened. Well, guess what? For those people who showed up, their lives were never the same again. They encountered Jesus, the Word of God, the Messiah, the Savior, the Lord. And I can't help but think that in the days to come that that they would tell this good news about what it meant to meet Jesus. So the question now simply is this. Um, Are you going to show up? Am I going to show up? I I think that when the Bible tells us that we must walk by faith and not by sight, I think it means that daily we say, God, I want to open my life to you. I can't help but think that during this time, um, this is especially, again, a time that we're reminded of our fragility, of the uncertainty of life, and how we need to have an anchor that holds us. And I, I don't want to be one of those people that just scoffs and dismisses Jesus. I want to show up and open my life to him. Well, how can you do that? Would you like to do that? Well, let me again just... Um, say a simple prayer that I've been saying over the last little while, just a way to say, here, this is how you can show up with God. Pray this with me. Dear God, thank you for this wonderful good news that we have about Jesus. It tells me about your love for me and about the life you have for me. I I accept this wonderful gift of salvation, and I trust in Jesus to be my Lord, my leader, my master. I'm sorry for my sins, and I thank you for the forgiveness by Jesus' death on the cross. I no longer want to run away from you or ignore you or live any purpose other than for you. 
Thank you for being my friend. I'm excited to be yours. Amen. So, when we look at this story of Jesus, and we're trying to answer this question, who is God? We have this wonderful truth today. God shows up. He shows up in my life. He shows up in your life. The question simply for us is, will we respond in faith with love to him? Well, thank you, Dave. Uh, that's a great message. And uh, it reminds me of a fairy tale. And if you don't mind, I'm going to tell my fairy tale because I think it's a great story. If you want to think about God not forcing himself and coming out of love more than anything, I'm reminded of the story of a king. Now, this king uh, was very powerful and very rich. And he fell in love with this common peasant girl. And he looked at the peasant girl and he thought, um, I want her to love me. And I love her so much and I need her to love me back. So he sat down and he began to think. He thought, well, I have a great army, and I can use my army to force her to, to love me. I can, I can go right into her town. I can pick her up with my army and bring her to me, and she'll love me because I'm powerful. And he realized, no, that wouldn't be real love. I'd just be forcing her to love me. So then he sat down and he thought, well, I've got so much money. I've got all these things, and I could buy her love. I could give her anything she wanted, give her all the things she could have ever dreamed of. But that wouldn't be real love be buying her love. So what the king decided was he'd come as a common man. He'd put on everyday clothes and go into the village where she lived and win her love and uh, come to know her as a person. And that's exactly what Jesus did. He wants us to love him authentically with real love. Well, we're going to move into our closing time now. Thank you for being with us. Thank you to everybody on the live stream who commented all along. It was uh, so encouraging for me to see you guys there. I miss you, and I'm looking forward to seeing you again soon. But uh, for now, we, we're going to appreciate how these live streams can bring us together. So thank you for that. Also, thank you to everybody who came in this week to help support us in giving. Uh, that, that was really encouraging to us. You, you know, if you're part of any kind of business right now, that... Uh, organizations are struggling, that there is, uh, we're on the verge of, you know, financial challenge, and the church is no different. And we just want to thank you for being, you know, diligent, supporting us, for all the people who came in this week and helped support us through push pay or, or other mediums. Thank you very much. That's so encouraging to us. If you're looking to support us or uh, give, you can see in the section below different ways you can give. Thank you for that. We appreciate it. Uh, well, we're looking forward to this week. More videos are going to be coming out. We've tried to be as regular as we can with our videos, and we'll send more this week. We're looking to unfold our 520 plan, which if you don't know what that is, uh, you can watch the last video that I put out, and we just want to care for you. We want you to feel loved. I know that I uh, want to feel loved for the people that have messaged me. Uh, it's nice to know that there's others who care. We're all going through this together. We're all in this together, and it's going to take time and community and people to get this thing figured out. So we want to be that for each other. Um, just to, to close, today's service is different, there's no question. And uh, for you at home, you might be thinking, where's the music? See, we're not trying to just put out the same thing that we offer on Sunday morning. That's not what we're doing. But if you do come to a regular service here, when everything blows over, when everything is resolved, uh, you'll find music. And we, we worship together. We think that as Christians, that's one of the best ways that we can glory, bring glory to God and, and um, and, and love God in that way. And if you're missing that music component, we would encourage you to make a worship playlist. We'd encourage you uh, to check out some songs. We, we've had all our worship leaders from our three campuses come together and say, what are some great songs to uh, help encourage our people and encourage our members and encourage the community in these times? So we've listed some songs for you below that you can check out, and we, we hope that you listen to those uh, through your day today, through your night, even now as you finish the service. Just take some time to meditate, listen, and focus on God, and maybe even through the week you'll go back to those songs. And that's our hope for you. Well, just one more, one more story as we close. These are the words of Martin Luther. And uh, just, just uh, meditate on these words as we go. It was August 1527, and the bubonic plague had come to Wittenberg, Germany. Everyone who could get out of the village was getting out. The elector of Saxony, John the Steadfast, ordered a famous professor and reformer, Martin Luther, to leave, and he refused. Along with his pregnant wife, Katharina, Luther stayed in Wittenberg, opening his house as a ward for the sick. And Luther was asked by another minister how to act in this time. And he said, go to him and minister to him who you will assuredly find Christ in. 
not according to the person, but in his word. For anyone who would minister to Christ in the body would also minister to his neighbor's needs. And yet, on the other hand, some sin too much. And on the right hand, they are too daring and foolhardy. They tempt God. They neglect all the things with which we ought to protect ourselves against pestilence and death and scorn the use of medicine. And do not avoid the places where there has been pestilence and the persons have had it. Not so, my dear friend. That would not be done well. Use medicine. Take whatever you may to be helpful to yourself. Fumigate your house, yard, and street. Avoid persons and places where you're not needed or where your neighbor has recovered. Act as one who would like to help to put out the general fire. What is pestilence, after all, but a fire which consumes body and life instead of wooden straw? Meanwhile, think thus. With God's permission, the enemy has sent poison and deadly dung among us. And so I will pray to God that he may be gracious and preserve us. Then I will hum fumigate and purify the air, give and take medicine, and avoid the places and persons where I'm not needed in order that I may not abuse myself and that through me others may not be infected and inflamed with the result that I become the cause of their death through my negligence. If God wishes to take me, he will be able to find me. At least I have done what he gave me to do and I'm responsible neither for my own death nor the death of others. But if my neighbor needs me, I shall avoid neither person nor place, but feel free to visit and help him. As has already been said, behold, this is true and God-fearing faith that is neither foolhardy nor rash and does not tempt God. Luther's words, uh, 500 years later almost, uh, echo the same situation that we're in. How do we be wise in this situation and how do we be neighbors? I'd encourage you to pick up your phone, call the people that you love and call people in your church family this is, this is a time where we can all be brought together uh, in spite of terrible circumstances. Thank you for being with us today. We appreciate you. We love you. And we look forward to being together soon. Uh, and in the meantime, we look forward to these live streams. So thank you. Feel free to uh, stay in the live stream as long as you want. Chat amongst yourselves. Share prayer requests. Whatever you want to do. But thank you for being with us today. And uh, we'll be praying for you in the meantime.